Hello class, welcome to lesson 3.3, Observational Studies and Experiments. So in this lesson, we're gonna explain the concept of confounding and confounding variables, and we're gonna talk about how it limits the ability for us to make cause and effect conclusions when we are looking at, say, observational studies, and just in general. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is explaining the purpose of comparisons in an experiment, and then describing what is known as the placebo effect and how and uh, double blind and single blind experiments and the purpose of using that in an experiment. So remember that observational studies are studies in which the individuals are observed and the variables are measured. The variables that you're interested in measuring are uh, measured, but remember that you as the researcher are not influencing the individuals. You're not doing anything. You're not adjusting any variables. You're just observing uh, the response. So when, therefore, when, we, when we're just observing the response, we might find some patterns in variables that we're interested in, right? So maybe as one variable increases, we find that another variable also increases. And so we find this pattern uh, or association known as correlation, right? So sometimes we can draw correlations among variables by using observational studies. But remember that correlation does not indicate causation. Just because two things are correlated or um, there's a relationship between them does not mean that one caused the other. Okay, so we'll, I'll give you an example. So say that you're observing students who uh, eat together with their families. And you notice that when you're observing them in the study, that students who eat together with their families tend to have better grades. And so you're trying to say, okay, well, there's a relationship between these two. What could that be? Uh, this doesn't mean, keep in mind, that just because there's a relationship between eating together with your families and having better grades doesn't mean that if you eat with your family more, you're going to get better grades, right? It doesn't mean that it caused the higher grades. There's got to be some sort of underlying cause, right? Some, some sort of uh, variable that's confounding the results. So there may be other variables at play. So for instance, uh, if you're eating together with your family more often, that might indicate you have more time to study. You might have less extracurricular activities. You might not have a part-time job. There's, there's these other things that, that kind of eat away at your time that might be related. So this might be a time issue, right? A time um, constraint for those who are not able to do this. And so this uh, variable is known as confounding. And the confounding variable is, in this case, we're looking at the amount of time, right, that they'll have. So confounding occurs when two variables are associated in such a way that there's effects on a response variables that cannot be distinguished, right, from each other. So um, for instance, like we mentioned earlier, uh, time was a uh, confounding variable, right? So it's, uh, it's something that kind of throws away, throws the whole dynamic um, of trying to indicate cause and effect. Right, so um, there's a relationship there, but there's no um, cause and effect because of these confounding variables that are kind of interfering. So uh, observational studies cannot definitively show a cause and effect. Remember that they can uh, demonstrate, you know, whether there's a correlation, but not necessarily a cause and effect because of this whole confounding principle. So how do you untie this confounding principle? Well, the way that you get rid of this uh, the confounding is by being able to adjust the variables, which means that you need to do an experiment. And so that's what we're going to head to in, in a second. But first, let's look at an example. So in a study of more than 4,700 children, uh, researchers from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical found that the children whose mothers smoked during pregnancy were more than twice as likely to develop ADHD as children whose mothers had not smoked. So they observed this by looking at uh, a study, right? Um, so based on this study, is it reasonable to conclude that a mother's smoking during pregnancy causes an increase in the risk of ADHD in her children? And so we wanna be able to explain um, our response here. So note that this is an observational study. We're not doing an experiment in which we're placing, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a group where mothers smoke during pregnancy, and then we're getting a group where mothers do not, right, smoke, et cetera. That would, that would there would be so many issues with that, right? Because of issues of ethics and things like that. If we know, now that we know that smoking, you know, causes an increased risk and uh, blood pressure and things like that, which you don't want during pregnancy. So there's just a lot of ethics issues there. So that aside, 
since this is an observational study, we know that we can't indicate cause and effect. We know that there's a relationship there, but that doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. So in this case, we have to see like, what are some confounding variables or what are some reasons that would also lead to this relationship in the fact that if mothers smoke during pregnancy, they're, they're more than twice as likely to develop ADHD. Well, it's possible that the mothers who smoked also had poor diets. And so we can't eliminate this variable because uh, we haven't um, done an experiment in order to eliminate this variable. So what you'd have to do is if you were to do an experiment, you'd have to keep the, the level of, uh, you had to, you'd have to keep the diet variable constant, right? In order to see if it was just a smoking that caused the change, right? So um, the issue, so it's not reasonable to conclude. So we'll go ahead and start there. So, um, so we got, so no, uh, it's not reasonable, right? So it's not reasonable to conclude. So uh, smoking, Uh, okay, let's put it this way. So there does seem to be an association. So there does seem to be a correlation between uh, smoking during pregnancy and risk of ADHD. However, uh, so we're going to talk about like some confounding variables here. So uh, we can mention that the mothers who smoked probably had unhealthy diets, right? So that could be a reason that would also lead to um, potential issues um, with um, the progeny, right? So in here, however, there are, um, so we can say that a possible confounding variable could be that these same uh, mothers, right, or these these same individuals also had poor diets, which would throw off the results, right? So, um, so you want to you want to be able to control for these variables, right? So that's the uh, idea about confounding. So, bottom line, uh, observational studies. Um, are good to to look at the data but essentially it's not reasonable to make these uh, sort of conclusions um, as if as long as there's confounding variables in the picture right so um, how do we control confounding well we control it with the use of um, experimental with a well-designed controlled experiment so to prevent this uh, we need to design an experiment that essentially keeps all other variables constant or fixed whereas only adjusting the variable that you want that you're interested in studying okay so let's look, let's look at an example of an experiment right and this is not necessarily a good experiment but it's an experiment nevertheless an experiment is just remember that it's just when you adjust the variables um but it does not necessarily have to be a well-designed experiment right as in this case so in this uh experiment we want to determine how caffeine affects pulse rates so here, here is the layout of the experiment. Each student measures his or her pulse. Then the student receives 12 ounces of cola. They wait for 15 minutes. And then the student measures his or her pulse again after the cola. And then they compare the two pulse rates, the initial, the prior, and the final pulse rate. So this is an experiment. You're adjusting the variables, right? You're, you're, you're looking at their pulse rates and then you're giving them a treatment, right? Essentially, you're saying that the student receives 12 ounces of cola. So that's sort of like a treatment, right? Now, this is a poor experiment because you're only, give, you're only doing the one treatment, but you're not comparing it to anything else, right? So what would happen if the student did not drink any cola 
or they drunk something else or they drank something else and that also affected the pulse rate. How can you eliminate those variables, right? So remember that the idea is we want to eliminate confounding. Uh, when you're drinking cola, is it the sugar in the cola that uh, caused the, um, the increase in the pulse rate or is it just that caffeine? We want to be able to eliminate this confounding. So what we could do is we can introduce another group of students uh, known as a control group and this is the group in which there is no treatment, right? Um, or um, so one group takes the caffeine soda, caffeinated soda, and then the control group takes the uncaffeinated soda and therefore with the same amount of sugar that way they both have the same amount of sugar and so it's it shouldn't be the sugar that would cause the um the change in the pulse because that's kept constant we could just compare the caffeine levels right so uh the per the problem with the experiment as we said is it should include a control group so the treatment group receives a caffeinated soda the control group could get the caffeine free cola and then you can just compare, okay, what happens if it's just caffeinated versus caffeine-free? caffeine, caffeine free? So, and that, that'll be a better way to compare. So a control group is a group used to provide a baseline for comparing the effects. So it helps you establish all of the variables to be the same and only, um, and then therefore allows you to uh, measure the variable that you're interested in to see the effect. So depending on the purpose of the experiment, a control group may be given an inactive treatment or an active treatment. Uh, so it just kind of depends on what you, what you want to design as your control group. So uh, in other words, remember that the groups should be treated exactly the same. All the variables are the same, are kept constant, except for the one that you want to test, which in this case is the caffeine level, right? We want to see how the caffeine affects the pulse rate. All right, so um, let's take a look at the following examples. So we got utility companies have introduced programs to encourage energy uh, conservation among their customers. An electric company considers placing digital displays on households to show current electricity use along with the projected monthly cost. Will the displays reduce electricity use? So one cheaper approach is to give customers a chart and information about monitoring their electricity use from the outside meter. Um, and then, so we're asking, would this method work almost as well? The company decides to conduct an experiment to compare the two approaches. One where you have the display, right, where um, it potentially reduces electricity use, right, but still gives you information. Uh, or the cheaper approach where, um, you know, you just get a chart and information, right? So we want to compare these two, the display versus the chart. Um, and then we want to we want to compare these with a control group where the customers receive information about their energy consumption, but they don't get any help in monitoring it, right? No display, no chart. They just give them information, right? Uh, explain why it was necessary to include the control group here. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So uh, why do we even need a control group? Remember what the purpose of the control group is. The purpose of the control group is to provide a baseline, right? Keep all other variables constant. So in this case, if we did not have a control group, we wouldn't be able to tell if the displays or the charts caused a reduction in, in the electricity use, right? So was it that the fact that the having the display cause the, the reduction in electricity use or was it the information about their or was it you know the information about hey I'm spending this amount on electricity or I'm using this much electricity so let me reduce the electricity use right so uh, which one is it right is it the display that actually did it or is it the fact that they gained information and by gaining information they were more educated and therefore attempted to reduce their energy consumption, right? So we wanna eliminate this confounding variable of, hey, I'm getting educated here, or, or I'm getting information. How, um, I wanna eliminate that variable, right? By gaining information, does that potentially affect their energy consumption? So if I include that as a control group, that eliminates that variable, right? Um, so in this case, it was necessary, as we said. Um, so the control group,
was necessary to determine whether it truly was uh, the display uh, the other one was a chart right um, slap or chart that led to the behavior right the behavior of you know the reduction in, uh, that led to energy uh, conservation rather than it rather than it being that they just gained information rather than it being the fact that customers were informed we'll put it that way so you were informed right was that the reason why you redu reduced your electricity use or was it because of this player chart right so we want to be able to eliminate uh, those pot potential sources Okay, so now there's another uh, interesting effect that you can get that 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 takes place when you're trying to um, set up an experiment, right? So we mentioned that for the caffeine versus the pulse rate experiment, we needed to two groups, right? One group with the treatment, right? Uh, and then the other group, which could be the group with without the treatment, or it could be reversed where the control group has the treatment and then the other one doesn't, right? Uh, as long as there, there are two different ways so you can compare them, right? So one had the caffeinated cola, the other one with non-caffeinated. So uh, funny thing, um, it turns out that if you knew, if you as uh, an individual were in this study and you knew what treatment you were receiving, so let's say you knew that you were receiving the non-caffeinated cola, that might actually, knowing that information might actually influence the result that you have. So knowing that you have sugar cola, um, or knowing that you have the caffeinated cola, that might infl uh, influence your thinking, and therefore it might influence your biology. It's really a, a weird effect, right? So, um, and this is known as the placebo, uh, essentially the placebo effect, right? Where like if you knew what treatment you were receiving, then this would influence uh, the results. So what we wanna do is we want to eliminate the knowing which treatment that you're having, right? So, um, so what we wanna do is even if you, uh, we wanna prevent this by kind of randomizing the individuals, like uh, we wanna determine by randomization that you're gonna be in this group and then this person is gonna be in the other group, but they can't both know which treatment they're receiving, right? Neither of them can find out whether they're receiving the true treatment or whether they're receiving the control group. So um, as we mentioned, this is known as the placebo effect that if you know the treatment that you're receiving, if you know which group you're belonging to in the study, that might influence the results. Even if the treatment is actually inactive. Uh, interestingly enough, even if it's a sugar pill, it still might cause um, a, these, a sort of similar response uh, than, uh, than the actual treatment. So we wanna make sure that it's not the knowing that influenced the result. So uh, the control group is, uh, as we mentioned, uh, the group that is used to compare, right, to the other group. And so usually the control group is offered the placebo, right? So in this case, the non-caffeinated cola. So placebo is a treatment that has no active ingredient, uh, but everything else is the same, right? So in this case, it's a cola, it's, co it's a cola, it's sweet, has the same amount of sugar, everything else is the same, except it has no caffeine. And they can't tell whether it has caffeine or not. That's the important part, right? So we can't have them knowing which treatment that they have. To mitigate the placebo effect, we wanna make sure that no one knows where they are. This is known as a blind trial. So there are two different potential trial designs. You can introduce a single blind experiment where um, neither, so none of the subjects know which group they belong to, right? Which treatment they're receiving. In a double blind experiment, the subjects and the researchers do not know um, which treatment the subject received, right? So even the researchers don't know um, like who was in what group. And so this is interesting because then you can actually eliminate the potential bias in the researchers, right? So the researchers might have an innate bias that maybe they are, they, um, are not aware of 
and that might influence the results. So having both of them be blind would actually um, help determine whether um, there is a true cause and effect here. So let's look at an example. So early research showed that magnetic fields affected living tissue in humans. Some doctors have begun to use magnets to treat patients with chronic pain. Scientists wondered if this type of therapy really worked. They designed the study to find out. So 50 patients with chronic pain were recruited. A doctor identified a painful site on each patient and asked him or her to rate the pain on a scale from zero to 10. So 10 being severe. The doctor selected a sealed envelope containing a magnet at random from a box with a mixture of active and inactive magnets. So the chosen magnet was applied to the site of the pain for 45 minutes. After being treated, each patient was again asked to rate the level from zero to 10. So in this experiment, the patient didn't know which type of magnet was being used. So this is important, right? The fact that the patient didn't know which treatment they received. Because uh, in this case, um, we want to see if they knew what type of magnet they would receive, right? Whether it has active, whether it's active or inactive, right? That might influence their result. So let's go ahead and include that. Okay, so the important thing is that we want to eliminate the fact that, hey, knowing which magnet they used might have improved their expectation of being better. And we want to be able to eliminate that. Okay, so um, we can say that, okay, so the way we can put this is that um, knowing uh, which treatment or which magnet they received might influence their expectation of improving, right? Improving as far as their health, right? Improving, um, you know, as far as the pain that they received and so on, right? So doctors would not be able to identify whether it's the magnet or the expectation of getting better, right? That actually improved you know, their symptoms, right? Uh, or the expectation of getting better. That led to the improvement. All right, so this is a very important uh, idea, the idea of the placebo effect and that we want to eliminate that. All right, guys, uh, that's it for the video. I hope you found this useful and informative. Uh, as usual, I'll see you in the next one.